Hi, my name is Lola Palomo, I'm an art historian and a singer, and today I'll be speaking to you about the art of the Northern Renaissance. So last week we were speaking about the art of Italian Renaissance, we spoke about Da Vinci, Botticelli and Michelangelo, and today I want to focus on paintings. Five different paintings that represent what was going on in the Northern states at the same time during the Renaissance. So today we'll be focusing on what was going on during the Renaissance north of the Alps and we will be looking at five different paintings that represent the Northern Renaissance. We will be speaking about the Garden of Earthly Delights by Euronymus Bosch, the Arnolfini portrait by Jan van Eyck, the Descent from the Cross by Roger van der Weyden, and finally, the self-portrait of Albrecht Dürer. So stick around and learn what was going on beyond Italy during the Renaissance and learn about these paintings while we go deeply into them and learn more about how to look at a painting and extract from it all the information it can give us. So see you there. As always, before we begin our focus on each of these paintings, I want to briefly overview what I mean by Northern Renaissance and what is understood by this term. Now the Renaissance, as we spoke of the last two sessions, is about the rebirth or the revival of Greco-Roman ideas. Now in the North, North of the Alps, which is France, the Netherlands, later on England, part what is today Germany, Poland, all that area. Yes, there are going to be ideas of the Greco-Romans coming back to them, but there is one thing that is more important than all of that put together, and that is the printing press. The development of the printing press is fundamental for the world, the Western world, but also for the Northern Renaissance because it's going to disseminate information and universities are going to develop and flourish with this new technology. It's technology in the sense that it started to uh, alleviate many people's um, need for information. And Another thing that's going to happen is the Protestant Reformation. So if this is the time of Martin Luther when he is going to translate the Bible into German. The printing press via, uh, uh, via the printing press is going to be disseminated. It's going to be translated into Dutch, into French, and people are going to transform their understanding of their relationship to God. So a lot of the times we think of Michelangelo's famous hand gesture, God and man, but this same idea is going on in other parts of the European continent in different forms. Feudalism is still going on, but uh, the cities are going to develop more and there is a new merchant class, which is going to be fundamental for what we are looking at today. Paintings in this time, as they are today, are a luxury item. And in this case, what we're going to see now in the Arnolfini portrait, our first stop of the day, it's going to show privilege and it's going to show status, social status in the merchant class, like it did in Italy, but now in the Netherlands, in another part of the world. Here is the Arnolfini portrait. You probably have seen it. It's something that all art history students studies at some point. And what you're seeing is two people have gotten married and uh, they are presenting themselves to society. First of all, yes, they are a married couple and they're, what they are wearing is important. He, uh, Arnolfini, is a merchant of fabric and what we are seeing in her specifically is very, very exquisite and expensive fabric. Her hand is being held by her a husband who is actually clothed not as exquisite as she is in a way to kind of show this Protestant idea of being a bit more sober. Now, as you can see, she is looking towards him and he is looking towards uh, to the front, not to us, but to the front. But this is saying that she serves him and he serves, I guess in this case, we can say um, universal law or God. Now, let's go directly to the mirror in the back, and that is something that we're going to see a lot of in the Northern Painters, which is this exquisite use of um, space, and they love to use these small mirrors to show off what they can do. And what we are seeing is, in the reflection of the convex mirror, we can see two, the two uh, married couple and then two other figures 
in the front. One of them might have been the painter. Now around the mirror we have moments of the passion of Christ and this is symbolizing salvation or the promise of salvation. And now that we're into the idea of symbols, let's get out the whole symbols of what's going on in this painting. There's a lot of symbols that have to do with luxury, with rich being rich and being wealthy. The oranges that are at the window, so this is, they have been brought in by merchants. They are not easily acquired, so this is an expensive element. Also, we have those two shoes that are left on the side. That's not a, an, <laughs> an error. That is to show that she does not need to go out of her house ever. She is so rich that people will bring things to her home. And the dog that is exactly between them is uh, a symbol of loyalty, of loyalty in this case, obviously of the marriage. The Descent from the Cross by Roger van der Weyden. Now this piece is at the Prado Museum, so I know it pretty well. And let's go and delve right in. So van der Weyden creates this piece to show off what he can do. This is a masterpiece in many ways. Let me show you a couple more uh, descents from the cross by him as well. And you can see definitely he was doing an effort in this piece and really trying to show us that yes, there is a lot going on. And now, as you can see, the, the image of Christ being descended from the cross and then people around him that are witnessing this grief, uh, this moment of grief. And the person that is going to be shown as, um, you know, next of kin and almost at the same uh, religious or level as him is Mary. And if you can see both figures, they're kind of together in a parallel S shape which is a perfect way to see how they are united. And in the backdrop, we have everybody else who is more in a vertical line. And that's going to be fundamental because yes, we are in a time when it's no longer that idea of hierarchy, um, Jesus and Mary would be huge and everybody else a tiny version, like we saw in the Middle Ages, that's no longer the case. But there has to be a way to be showing that they are of another level. And also what we're seeing here is that Mary is really um, grieving, almost dead herself. And that is going to be extraordinarily important because this is a time when the image of Mary is and the story of Mary is developing even more. So all these figures are important to the descent of the cross. And what's going on is that, remember that in humanism, we talked about the importance of individuality. That's what we are seeing in Van der Weyden's presentation of the cross. There are, you can see many tears, literal tears of the people you know, mourning what has, has been going on. And it looks very extraordinarily, uh, it's a pathos that we can almost feel. And the figures are almost life size. And this is a way to show what is what do we mean by Renaissance in the North? Yes, there is still going to be a lot of uh, religious elements and figures and art, but they are taking things differently. In a way, there is almost more realism in the figures' faces. If we compare them, for example, to a Fra Angelico, that it's kind of the same time. This is 1435, so the, Quattrocen the early Quattrocento artists were also uh, developing realism in Italy, but this type of realism that is almost post-medieval uh, exquisiteness almost takes it to the next level. <laughs> Now the third painting that we're going to see today is by Euronymous Bosch, The Garden of Earthly Delights. And this was painted in 1490. We're going in a chronological order. So we have reached now the end of the 15th century with Bosch. And a lot of people, you can't really place him in time when you see this piece, for example, that is very, very well known uh, that you're seeing now. When is this really Renaissance? Well, yes, it is in many ways. Now let's dive right in. So it is a triptych, which means it's in three parts and it can be closed. And when you close it, this is the image that you see, which is a globe and it's a sphere. So when you open it, a triptych is to be read as a book from the left to the right. And the first image that we're gonna see, so what happens after the third day? What does Genesis say? The animals and the people. And that's what we have on the first panel. And what you're seeing is, yes, the Garden of Eden. God is presenting Eve to Adam. 
and that is symbolizing holy matrimony. So from the first panel, we know that there is going to be a theme of matrimony. And what God says, according to scripture, is go forth and multiply. And the imagery that we're going to see in the other panels are what we should take heed of. If you continue your, your eyesight and you take it to the next panel, which is the centerpiece, this is why the Garden of Earthly Delights gets its name. We have the center panel where it seems we're still in heaven. It's the same color palette as the one that we saw in Eden. But if you start to take a look a bit closer, things are very different. So what you're seeing is pleasure-seeking activities and self-absorbed joy free will for all. It's a free for all. Everybody can do whatever they want. And evident, evidently there's a lot of sexual tension, sexual activities going on everywhere. And that is coming from the idea of holy matrimony. So it is said that this piece was given as a, um, a wedding gift. We're not very sure who, who gave it to whom. It was confiscated during the wars uh, with the Dutch. Um, but what we do seem to see is that the, the idea of marriage in the Garden of Eden and the idea of sexual freedom in the Garden of, in the center, there seems to be like a heed of uh, where, be aware what's going to happen because when you look at the third panel, that's when things get a bit more complicated and that's where the color palette goes to black goes to gray and the animals really start to look scary. And that is the message that we're seeing Bosch present to us. This self-absorbed joy and this wildness that the people in the center are frolicking about is going to have consequences, dire consequences that we're going to see in the third panel. In the last panel, what we're seeing is hell. And the thing is, the way that you develop your life in the world is how you're going to either go to heaven and go to hell and if you go to hell depending on what sins you did is how you're going to spend the rest of your eternal life in hell so this piece is usually a lot of the times it's called um, the musical hell because there's a lot of musical instruments that are suddenly become torture instruments <laughs> piece of the day is a self-portrait by my crush at 13 years old, Albrecht Dürer. So when I was a young teenager, I had a crush on this painter for a long time. <laughs> you know, you always, crushes of teenage years, you never understand them, but there you go. So he was a German uh, painter from Nuremberg. So again, we're in the, the south of Germany, north of the Alps. And he was very much a Renaissance man. In books of art history, you'll find him very much uh, understood as the counterpart of Da Vinci in the Northern Renaissance because he was very much a um, nature lover and he also did a lot of studies of anatomy. Now, this self-portrait is special. As you can see, he is very symmetrical, almost like, yeah, does he remind you of anybody? Yeah, so he looks very much like Christ. This is an almost Christ-like image. That's where he doesn't look like, uh, is nothing like Da Vinci. He, Durer was very much self-aware and very much aware of his value as a painter. And a painting like this one, where he is looking forward, is not something that is usual for portraits of this time. The way he is holding his hand. So he is not, you know, doing the sign of the cross, but he almost looks like he is. Now let's look at other portraits that he did of himself as a young man. He is presenting himself as a painter and as a person of value as a painter. And that is something that we're not seeing before. And it's also an element of the Renaissance, as we saw with Michelangelo. And we saw, for example, Botticelli presenting himself and many other self-portraits of the Italian Renaissance artists throughout the other videos that we saw. So that's it for our story today. We've seen five different moments of the Northern Renaissance painters, and I hope you enjoy this way of looking at paintings in a very deep and focused manner. So next week we'll be speaking about the Spanish Baroque. If you like what you see, 
and want to subscribe, please do so. That would be a great help. Next week, as I said, we will go into the Spanish Peninsula and see what was going on at the same time in the Spanish Kingdom. So stick around and as always, make sure creativity is part of your day. See you then.